Chapter Seventeen of Pioneer Work in the Alps of New Zealand by Arthur Paul Harper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter Seventeen: A Pass to the Hermitage. Instructions to go to the Hermitage. Forestalled. Meet Fitzgerald and Zurbriggen at last. Saltwater Creek. Pass to Tasman Glacier. A memorable meeting at the Hermitage. Solitary journey back to Copeland River. West Coast work discussed. Complete the exploration of Copeland River. Returning from the hill to Scott's farm, I spent a few more days completing my map before sending it to headquarters, intending to start in a few days to inspect the range west of the footstool, with a view to taking a direct track to the Hermitage. This, as I have already stated, was the line I, and one or two others, had for some time past held to be the only likely route. It was direct and possessed grand scenery but the government had required a route which should be, quote, free of snow and ice for three months every year, end quote, and therefore this was not acceptable. However, now that Douglas and I had proved, what many of us have known for years, that no such pass as required existed without going an unreasonable distance to the south, they at last made the best of a bad job, and decided to inspect the Copeland again, Douglas having already reported on it in 1892. The evening before I was to leave Scott's house for the Hermitage, Dick, who had been at the camp, arrived with two strangers, whom I at once recognized as Fitzgerald and Zurbriggen. They had just come over from the Hermitage, by the very pass I was going to cross, and had forestalled me in the passage by a few days. However, I was glad they had come, and congratulated them on finding the pass, for though we have known of its existence, no one had crossed it. Note. See Appendix. Note 5. End of note. They seem to have considered the river a very bad one to descend. This opinion of the character of the travelling is rather useful by way of comparison, because Douglas and I look on the Copeland River as an easy one, for the west coast, to descend, if taken the right way, and it fully bears out what I have already stated, namely, that what we call fair travelling is, to those unaccustomed to the work, really very bad. Fitzgerald said he made use of five languages to properly express his opinion of the rough going. I therefore calculate that he would have had to use at least ten if he had come down some of the other rivers, or else kept silence. It can well be imagined what a treat it was to spend a day or two with Fitzgerald, who was elected member of the Alpine Club on the same day as I was, and knew many of my friends in England. We had a long talk about Switzerland, England, and affairs in general. I was also anxious to have a talk with him about the good work he and his guide had been doing in New Zealand this season, and was pleased to hear that his enterprise had met with such well-deserved success. They had intended to go back by the Franz Joseph Glacier, but I dissuaded them, for I felt sure that so late in the year it would be impassable. Also, it would take two days to reach it. After some discussion, I suggested the route I had planned last year while on the Fox Glacier as an interesting one, namely over the Bismarck Range to the Franz Joseph Neve, and thence over Graham's saddle to the Tasman. Fitzgerald kindly pressed me to be his guest, and returned with him, an invitation I most gladly accepted, chiefly for the pleasure of a week with them, and partly because it enabled me to share the first transinsular pass via Graham's saddle. I had a desire to cross this, for I had already been within an hour of it from both east and west, the actual pass having been left unfinished in the latter case, when easily in our reach, for reasons stated in Chapter 11. Sending Dick, therefore, up the Copeland River to Welcome Flats, some eight miles above its junction with the Karangarua, with a light camp and four week stores, I left Scott's for the Fox Glacier, with Fitzgerald and Zurbriggen. My plan was to cross with them to the Tasman, perhaps ascend Mount Cook, and then return alone via the pass they came by, which I named Fitzgerald's Pass, to the Copeland River, joining Dick, who was to meet me at Welcome Flat in a fortnight with all the stores. We rode to Gillespie's Beach, crossing the Saltwater Creek and Cook River Ferry, and thence went up to Ryan's lower hut on Cook River, situated two miles nearer the sea than the hut which Douglas and I had made our base of operations the previous summer. There was no trouble in crossing the Saltwater, luckily, as the tide was out. This creek is one of the most dangerous to ford on the coast. It has since been bridged above the lagoon. Like most other streams, its course is, at times, blocked by a bar of gravel thrown up by the sea, and is easily crossable, but it generally runs out amongst large stones and very deep, 
giving considerable trouble. The Maoris call it Ohinutamatia. This was the name of a woman who, according to the legend, was going with her two sons up on the outer range of hills for some purpose, when she fell ill and died on the grassy alp above the bush line. The two sons, being unable to bury her, made a heap of dry grass and burned her where she died. They then went over a ridge, following some tuis, which flew in front and guided them to a splendid valley full of wekas, where they lived in plenty for some time. On returning by the route they had gone, they discovered a spring of water rising on the spot where their mother had been burnt, and flowing down to the low country, formed the creek named Ohinu Tamatia, or sometimes spelt Ohinitamatia. It is possible that these two natives crossed a spur of Ryan's Peak, and dropping into the Copeland River, reached Welcome Flats, for the Saltwater Creek flows from near this peak. As we had some thirty pounds each to carry, Fitzgerald brought Dan Coiti to carry his load and we all rode up to a point a mile below the terminal face of the fox glacier arriving there in somewhat heavy rain and i was able to amuse my host and sir Brigan by a little bit of bushcraft we had no tent and when it began to rain they were for returning to the hut which would waste a day but i showed them how to build a mai mai or shelter of ferns and bark like those i generally use in which with the help of a piece of mackintosh and a blanket we spent two wet nights in perfect comfort on Sunday, March 3rd, we reached the Chancellor Ridge, following my route of last year, and chose a stone at the lower end under which to camp. It was raining most of the evening, and snow set in at sundown, but we had a good though small shelter. Luckily, however, there was plenty of scrub, which burns, green or dry, and I was able to boil the billy I had brought in my load, and we had a good hot brew of cocoa before we turned in. Douglas had given us a blanket, and I brought two of my own, which allowed us one apiece and right glad we were of their warmth, when the sky cleared and a frost set in. About 2.30 a.m. we got up and kindled a fire, which enabled us to have two hot drinks of cocoa before starting. I was amused at Zurbriggen, because he did not know whether to praise the steaming cocoa or blame the delay caused by letting it cool. I suppose guides are always a little hard to please. Dan, by the way, had only brought up his load to the foot of the Chancellor Ridge, and then Fitzgerald sent him back to take the horses back to scots on the previous evening as i had to return down the copeland river and might be stuck by the floods i carried one of my blankets over the pass with us the others we left at the bivouac with the billy and half a flask of whiskey they are still there leaving the sleeping place about four o'clock in the morning we went up the victoria glacier towards the saddle into the fritz glacier which i had found on the previous year and on reaching the foot of the rise we roped the ascent to the col gave no trouble and from there Zurbriggen, who still rather underrated the broken nature of our glaciers, led us up the middle of the Fritz Neve. We soon found the Bergschrunz too bad, and had to return and ascend a ridge which bounded the Victoria Glacier. From this we crossed the top of the Fritz, and reaching a call leading into the head of the Blumenthal, a tributary of the Franz Joseph Glacier. This saddle we named after Zurbriggen. From here we could see the great Neve of the latter glacier, and in front of us the spurs of the Bismarck Range stood out, separating the Melchior and Agassiz glaciers, also tributaries of the Franz Joseph. Behind us the Waikukupa River, which drains the Fritz ice, was visible to the sea. It has no special features about it, being merely a straight, narrow valley, which would probably be a difficult one to ascend. Below, on the left, the fearfully broken ice of the Franz Joseph gave Sir Brigan something to examine through the glasses, he acknowledged that it looked impassable, but would not commit himself from that height. On our right, Tasman's mighty shoulders and vast brown cliffs rose in all their glory from the Fox Neve, and to the south we could see over the country which Douglas and I had explored in 1894. Leaving the call after a short spell, we rounded the head of the Blumenthal Glacier, and reached the spur dividing it from the Melchior. This had appeared to present no difficulty when I passed under it in September, 1894, but now we found some little trouble in descending to the glacier below. No doubt the shortest way would have been round the base of the spur, which ended in a steep face of rock, but I had strongly opposed that route, as the lower ice of the Melchior is always very broken. So Brigan, however, soon found a feasible route down the rocks, and we descended to the Melchior Glacier. Everything was in our favour clear day, hard snow, and easy walking. So it was fairly early when we reached the point to turn up to Graham's saddle. 
had the snow been in the good order it was now when i was on the neve in september we should have been on graham's saddle in less than half an hour from where we had turned back unfortunately we now made the mistake of spending an hour here melting some snow over a candle for we were rather thirsty so it was well after five p m when we mounted the ridge and overlooked the tasman glacier what a glorious panorama of ice can be seen from here i have twice before in eighteen ninety one seen the same view when on de la beche and should never tire of seeing it again the fog over the low country prevented a clear view westwards but the tasman could be seen sweeping down mile after mile to the terminal face nearly fourteen miles away drawing its supplies from innumerable ice-falls and glaciers off the main range de la beche rose one thousand feet above us on the left and the rudolph glacier flowed away from the saddle on which we were to join the tasman four thousand feet below time however was precious if we intended to reach the ball hut that night so we could not delay on the pass hitherto i had been last on the rope but knowing this slope of de la beche only too well we swung round and i took the lead travelling as fast as the very hard snow would allow down to and across the neve of the rudolph glacier a short ascent of two hundred feet was here necessary up a slope rather open to falling stones but previous experience had showed me it was the only way so we scrambled up the snow to some rocks down which the descent was easy here we unroped and after a short traverse to the left got into an open cool walk and hurried down to some steeper rocks below how different from the last occasions i had gone over these same rocks and snow slopes then i had twice a sick companion and once a terrific storm now we had a clear still evening and were all as fit as the proverbial fiddles on nearing the bottom we found the rocks coated with ice as it rapidly became dark my poor old boots were not up to such slippery work at any speed therefore before we knew where we were it was dark and we had to sit down on a ledge five feet by two and wait for dawn zurbriggen and i took the outside so were unable to sleep but fitzgerald towards midnight had a little quiet though uncomfortable dozing as he sat between us with his knees under his chin my two companions had dry socks and boots but i had nothing so put my feet into zurbriggen's spare gloves and rucksack we managed to make the latter angry during the night and it took an hour to calm him down they then tried to put my back up so as to pass the time but being prepared for it i did not lose my temper however we spent another hour over the futile attempt at midnight we sang some songs ending up with the most appropriate one we could find namely we won't go home till morning it was now rather cold and my thermometer had fallen to twenty five degrees fahrenheit which i endeavoured to explain to zurbriggen was the cause of the cold however he seemed to have some settled notion in his head that the weather and temperature affected the instruments and all my eloquence could not convince him that in new zealand the instruments affected the weather this occupied another hour and then the cold was becoming troublesome so i unpicked my blanket bag which we had over our knees and opened it to the full size of the blanket this we put over our heads and tucked down behind us making a rough tent each taking a candle we held it between our feet and produced quite a warm current of air it was very amusing to watch fitzgerald he would hold his candle and drop off to sleep in a short time the candle would burn down and wake him up with a start as it scorched his fingers muttering some foreign lingo he would lower his hand another two inches and again doze off with the same result at last the light of dawn appeared on the top of cook and we slowly untied ourselves from the various knots and twists which invariably result from a long night on a small ledge nothing will persuade any of us that the sun did not for once in his life oversleep himself and rise an hour or two late my boots were too hard frozen to put on so i cut them open and made sandals of them trusting that adamson at the hermitage would have an old pair to give me for my return to the west coast three hours easy walking took us to the ball hut where we had breakfast and waited for adamson who was to meet fitzgerald there by previous arrangement about midday he arrived and i returned with him in the evening to the hermitage where i spent the night and obtaining from him two old boots went back to the hut with a heavy load of provisions for four days we stayed in that hut waiting for a good day to ascend cook but it rained one day and snowed the next then fitzgerald decided to give it up and go down to the hermitage i could not help contrasting the comfort of this hut and the convenience of the track 
with our difficulties in the past years yet from the way my two friends expressed themselves i suppose it must even now be considered more than ordinarily rough i know that as compared with zermatt and grindelwald it is very uncivilized work even at the hermitage but is not the luxury at those two places rather too great the pleasantest surprise of the whole trip awaited me at the hermitage when coming up to the hotel i saw a visitor coming from the house and said to fitzgerald why that must be tuckett but he's not out here however on getting nearer i found that it was mr f f tuckett with whom i had spent some pleasant days in england in eighteen ninety two it appears he had come up for two days to the hermitage and having heard i was on the west coast never expected to see me but curiously enough we both arrived on the same day nothing could have given me greater pleasure and having introduced fitzgerald to him we three members of the alpine club sat down with a swiss guide in the smoking-room of the little hermitage and were soon over the seas to the other side of the world it was a memorable occasion for me at any rate and the second pleasant ray of sunshine on my uncivilized life in the ranges but it only lasted for one night as he left for christchurch next morning with fitzgerald driving his buggy to fairly creek where the road meets the railway sir brigand and i spent the twelfth in going for a short walk up the hooker glacier and he showed me the whole of his and fitzgerald's fine climb up sefton the evening was chiefly spent in discussing mount cook for sir brigand was bent on the ascent and i was anxious to accompany him however duty before pleasure is an universal rule and i felt that my absence had already been too long and that if i did not return at once dick might go down to scott's and raise an alarm justified by my non-appearance for no one had ever crossed the range alone as i proposed to do now sir brogan's very enticing proposal had therefore to be refused on the thirteenth i left the hermitage alone for the west coast taking a loaf of bread a bill-hook and blanket the same moment the sir brigand left with adamson for green's bivouac namely at six a m the route lay up the hooker glacier for a mile or two and then i crossed and took a spur about a mile further west than fitzgerald and sir brigand ascended when they crossed after some interesting climbing along a broken arete i reached a small ice field which was steep and covered with fresh snow it took me forty-five minutes to traverse an awkward bergschrung having to be crossed before i reached the topmost rocks of the range at one p m i topped the divide at a point about a mile west of fitzgerald's saddle and dropping down an ice-filled couloir on the copeland side i traversed round to inspect the pass leaving there at two p m i descended through the clouds to the valley of the marchant glacier and douglas river though my route was to this point different to fitzgerald's and sir brigand's it presented as far as i can gather about the same amount of difficulty excepting the fresh snow on the rocks and ice which i found and the disadvantage naturally consequent on a man travelling alone the two journeys however afford such good examples of the wrong and right mode of descending a west coast river that i venture to quote the times taken on each occasion and to describe shortly the best way of attacking this country in hopes that i may be of service to climbers making a similar expedition in future these rivers must be attacked by others than douglas and myself so it is as well that the best mode of procedure should be known for the work is unlike anything found in switzerland or on the eastern side of our alps fitzgerald and zurbriggen told me that they had left the hermitage at five a m an earlier hour than i did and bivouacked later on the second day again started earlier and at four thirty p m reached welcome flats and on the third day they made my camp below the junction of copeland and karangarua about six p m reaching scott's house after nine p m that evening i left the hermitage as stated one hour later than they did and travelled half an hour less but managed to bivouac half a mile lower down the river on the first day than they and on the second though starting half an hour later arrived at welcome flats by eight forty five a m instead of four thirty p m or ten hours in advance of their time at this point judging by our trip down from here to scott's three weeks later i could have reached his house by ten p m on the second evening that is in two days instead of three from the hermitage the reason of their longer times is to be found after reaching the grass line on the copeland for up to this point they were ahead of me the natural result when two men are together above the snow line 
on arriving at the grass they descended straight down to the river and began to clamber over the great boulders here and there meeting one which compelled them to go into the scrub the scrub in this valley is not bad for the west coast that is to say worse is to be found elsewhere here they would meet the usual tangle of stiff unbreakable and stunted vegetation which would alone account for the use of the five languages they found necessary in a short time they would again take to the river bed and have more hoisting on one another's shoulders crawling under stones and sliding down slippery boulders followed by another deviation into scrub and so on ad libitum for let us say three or four miles this would be succeeded by open travelling and long stretches of still more boulders involving feats which would to quote fitzgerald turn a gymnast's climber's hair grey considering that they took these difficulties on a face as the diggers say the times made by those two were good but the pity of it is that it was all a waste of energy owing to their having no means of ascertaining how to tackle this country it is to prevent such a waste of time in the future that i am contrasting our experiences on reaching the grass the first thing to do was to have a good look at the valley it was evident that there was no spur or ridge to follow above the scrub but it was also evident that on reaching the second large creek flowing down on the left i could go up it for some two hundred feet and reaching a piece of open grass could skirt the scrub till another large open creek was reached thus avoiding an evil-looking part of the river which to a west coaster's eye meant mischief the result was some fairly rough and tumble work in the river a stiff but short ascent up an open creek bed and good travelling for a short distance to the next open creek from which a view could be obtained round a bend in the river there was however nothing to be done here but descend and follow the river for nearly a mile yet the time saved by the above deviation was probably more than two hours than one from here i had to follow the same tactics as they pursued and made the best of a bad job until the inflow of the strontian river half a mile below my bivouac was reached here it was at once evident that as the bush was composed of large rata trees it would afford fairly open going therefore by ascending one hundred feet from the river and traversing along the hillside i avoided endless work amongst large stones and reached welcome flats in ten hours shorter time than they did below the flats the same course has to be pursued namely go back from the river because the valley is here for a short distance as bad as cook river for large boulders the copeland is not as i have already said a bad river to descend for there is no bluff necessitating a high climb like that described on the landsborough and cook rivers nor is there a bad gorge like the karangarua and calorie rivers none of those rivers can be descended without high climbs i do not think the route i took down the copeland would account altogether for the shorter time it was probably due to some extent to my being generally more accustomed to rough work than fitzgerald and Sobrigan, but the method would be answerable for at least two-thirds of the difference in time on arriving at welcome flat i saw some footmarks which showed me that dick had been there and a little bit of tracking along the gravel soon discovered the camp dick arrived in the evening having been down for the last load of provisions which he had left at a rock where he slept on his way up i now had to traverse the douglas river from the forks of the copeland to the marchant glacier as douglas had not followed it to the head in eighteen ninety two because it was evident that no pass absolutely free of snow existed there thinking it possible that some party might come over the pass during the following summer we spent some days blazing narrow tracks through the scrub wherever the river compelled one to leave the open these were marked most plainly with cross sticks note owing to my report that a track via this pass would be most expensive i fear there is no immediate prospect of the government undertaking its formation a considerable portion of such a track would have to be built up with solid masonry as the rock is very rotten End of note. it was the twenty ninth of march before we explored the marchant glacier as there had been some very stormy and cold weather a biting wind blew and the thermometer never rose above fifty degrees fahrenheit and was constantly below thirty two degrees a low temperature for us in our tattered and draughty clothes the copeland river has two main branches the douglas on the south from the marchant glacier and the main branch from the north draining the strontian glacier douglas had visited the latter glacier in eighteen ninety two and as i wanted some photographs of it we returned and camped on the thirty first 
half a mile below the forks here we sparred the river in order to get to the northern bank this operation is generally fairly easy but here it gave us considerable trouble we found two large stones ten feet apart between which the whole river had to pass and hoisted a fifteen-foot spar of totra on to the top of one of them intending to launch it over the gap this however was difficult for the stone we were on was narrow and did not allow room to manipulate so large a piece of timber comfortably accordingly we went two hundred yards down the river to a place where a boulder of thirty feet in height overhung the river and nearly met the branches of a tree on the opposite bank after some slippery barefooted work we got on to the top of this stone and a gap of a few feet separated us from the branches the river boiling and foaming past thirty feet below dick went back down the stone on the side away from the river and there he secured himself with the rope ready in case i fell and i with rope round my waist made a spring of a few feet under the branches of the tree and succeeded in reaching the opposite shore safely we then adjourned to our spar and with a rope and man at each end launched it with ease and were able to cross in comfort having agreed to bar fooling in camp as my diary says we went up the strontium glacier on all fool's day but had bad luck with the fog which only gave us isolated glimpses of the views of cook and stokes to the north and sefton to the east after waiting three or four hours for the clouds to lift we gave it up and returned to camp on the second and third we journeyed down the river completing some observations and repitched our camp below the junction of the copeland and karangarua rivers at the point where dick had blazed a track up the spur of ryan's peak which i had to ascend before returning to civilization End of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of pioneer work in the alps of new zealand by arthur paul harper this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter 18. Copeland River and General Work. Welcome Flats, Douglas River, Ruareka, Strontian Glacier, Decrease of Native Birds, First Ascent of Ryan's Peak, Return to Hokitika, Conditions of Our Work, Topographical Knowledge. Before describing our ascent of Ryan's Peak, I shall give an account of the Copeland Valley, which, like all others on this side of the divide is of wonderful grandeur and bears many interesting traces of ancient glaciers it does not equal the twain and karangarua in the latter respect but for scenery it is in every way on a par with them before reaching welcome flats for a short distance some really bad and large boulders obstruct the valley and amongst these giants some beautiful glimpses of mount sefton and the footstool can be seen with the great rata trees making an effective frame to the picture welcome flats some seven or eight miles up form an ideal spot for a hotel the surroundings would delight the heart of the most discontented tourist provided of course that the cooking was good for that seems to be a matter of greater importance to many than the scenery imagine for a moment an open flat-bottomed basin one mile by half a mile in the high ranges at each end of which the valley narrows to such an extent that it appears to cease the river flows down over a grey shingle bed one hundred yards wide and has grassy flats on each side for two hundred yards at the broadest place with a terrace or two to vary the monotony of the level between the grass and the hillsides another two hundred yards or so of flat ground is covered with luxuriant forest which on the north bank grows up the spurs to a height of three thousand five hundred feet above sea level or two thousand feet above the flat and on the south side stops abruptly at the foot of towering grey precipices which rise for three thousand and four thousand feet these grand cliffs are cut into couloirs and gullies with wonderful effect and their summit is serrated to a marvellous degree douglas waxes eloquent over this scene and that should be good proof that it is of surpassing grandeur because he has spent twenty years in traversing untrodden valleys containing glorious scenery he likens the sierras as he named these cliffs to a badly made saw Quote, it looks as if some giant with little skill and a very bad file had attempted to make a saw out of the mountains other countries may show fine glaciers and higher mountains but i doubt if anything finer than the sierra exists out of the moon End quote. note new zealand land and survey report eighteen ninety two to ninety three page forty three End of note 
I should not venture so far as the latter statement, for it is rather broad, but this part of the Karangarua range will some day attract much attention. Between the various peaks a glimpse can be caught of snow, which is the upper portion of the Douglas Neve, and bears out what I stated in the last chapter of the slope on the south and the precipice on the north side of the ranges here. To the north, Mount Little towers up, with a fine ice field of the second order on its slopes, looking higher than it really is, owing to its isolated position. The view of the peak is flanked by high, dark green bush-covered hills, which enclose a dark and gloomy valley, down which the Ruera River flows, draining the glaciers off Little and Copeland Peaks. The snow line on these peaks must be only 5,000 feet. It is difficult to attempt a description of such scenery, and Welcome Flat includes all kinds. On the one side, beautiful alpine and snow-covered peaks. On the other, weird and awesome rock precipices. And in the midst, a peaceful valley, in which pigeons may be seen rocketing in the evenings, and the few birds left by the weasels and cats are as tame as usual. The Douglas River is more like the upper twain in its surroundings, not perhaps so fine in some respects, but still far grander than most places accessible to the ordinary traveller. Mount Sefton rises over 7,000 feet above the river, in bare rocky slopes and precipices, so steep that no glacier of any size can find a place. The Marchant Glacier, at the head of the valley, has fine surroundings, and owes part of its existence to avalanches from the cliffs above. Two good rock peaks on the north, which I named Unicorn and Dilemma, have one of those peculiar little glaciers, perched on a narrow ledge, so common in Westland, and due to a portion of the avalanche ice being caught in its downward career. The short, divergent banks range branches to the west, separating the Strontian and Martian glacier from near Ruareka Peak, which lies at the head of the valley. This peak we named after a Maori woman, who was said to have found her way over to the east coast many years before New Zealand was colonized. She had some ornaments and tools made of greenstone, which is found largely on the west coast. The Naitahu tribe, by whom she was found, made her lead a party of warriors back over the range by her route. The invaders seized all the greenstone they could find, and many fights between them and the Natimamoi tribe took place, in which the latter were generally defeated. Te Urira, the chief of the defeated tribe, however, made a final stand at Taihoka, and endeavored to drive the invaders back, but was again compelled to give way. He then retired further south with a few faithful followers, taking his sacred mere, the badge of office, into the accessible mountains between the Otago Sounds and lakes, and there disappeared. Rumors of recent date point to the existence of this lost tribe even now, for fires are said to have been seen in the hills from the sea coast, but no reliable evidence of their survival has been found. Some of the Naitahu tribe settled on the west coast, and were in turn defeated by invaders from the North Island, who also left some of their number behind to intermarry with the vanquished tribe. My old friend Bill was descended from one of these North Island men, and had a South Island mother. The Marchant Glacier has five well-formed lateral moraines on the north side, one of which is very fine, having about 200 feet slope to the glacier on the south, and nearly 150 feet descent on the northern side, with an unbroken ridge of grass for some distance along the top. The whole of the trunk is covered with heavy debris, which gives the head of the valley a desolate appearance. Looking back, however, from a mile up the glacier, the cliffs of Mount Sefton, with slopes of scrub-covered debris at their base, look very imposing, and I very much doubt if such a grand series of rock precipices is to be found elsewhere in New Zealand. The southern end of the Strontian Valley is entirely blocked by a high moraine of five hundred feet through which the river has cut a deep channel. Whether this bar has been formed by the present Strontian glacier alone, or by the old Marchant ice, is not clear. I am inclined to think that, to some extent, both are responsible for it. The ancient glacier in the Douglas Valley was once the largest and most important, and it is only because the surrounding hills are so steep and face the north that such a small remnant now remains. From the point we reached about two miles up the Strontian ice, which is completely moraine-covered, the view of Mount Cook over Baker's Saddle is as good as any I have seen of the peak. It is framed, as it were, by the 1,500-foot precipices of the Unicorn and 4,000 feet of sheer cliffs from Mount Stokes. I believe 
from the glimpse i had of stokes in the fog that at one place a stone thrown out say eighty yards would fall four thousand feet without touching anything the bluff was at the end of a short spur which seemed to have been sliced down with a knife at the end and the lower part of two sides looking not unlike the buttressed and gabled end of a great cathedral four thousand feet from roof to base the avalanches off the western face of stokes appeared to me as to douglas to be swallowed up in their downward career by some gap in the mountain side this we were able to account for after our visit up cook's river as already related west of the Uruera river which flows into welcome flat mount little sends off a high spur which encloses a large valley with ryan's peak this valley is architect creek and was evidently in the past occupied by a glacier from the signs of ice action on the spur of ryan's peak where i found two rows of boulders suspiciously like old lateral moraines it is possible that the cook river glacier sent a stream over the low saddle of three thousand eight hundred and ninety feet at the head of this valley there are however few signs of ice action on this saddle and i am inclined to disagree with douglas on this point and consider that the saddle was formed by constant denudation since the great glacier period the valley of architect creek however has at one time no doubt been filled to a great depth with ice either a glacier originating from the peaks around or from an overflow of cook glacier the valley however must have been very much shallower at that time before leaving the copeland river let me give an example of the decrease of native birds in some of the valleys due to weasels and cats in douglas's report already quoted he speaks of the gradual disappearance of birds in all valleys during the last few years and continues to say that quote, welcome flats put one in mind of the other days it was swarming with birds the kiwis were of larger size than usual the wekas were large-sized more like otago or canterbury birds the robins ate out of one's hand the bellbird sang its chorus in a style only now to be heard south of jackson's bay while the blue ducks were as tame as of yore with the exception of the kakapo which i did not expect to see as i never saw one outside the mountain birch every bush bird was represented on the flats End quote. it is hard to believe that birds could disappear so quickly as they have in this valley compare douglas's picture of peace and plenty with mine three years later i should say that never with the exception of cook river and the twain valley have i seen such a dearth of birds of kiwis we neither saw nor heard a trace of wekas we caught two and saw one dick says he heard one robin which is more than i did bellbirds were either non-existent or silent of blue ducks we saw one pair so wild that we could not get near them whereas douglas caught and shot some thirty wekas and between twenty and thirty ducks for food on the river generally and left hundreds we only got three kakas two pigeons and two wekas and instead of like douglas finding too much to eat and having to leave stores behind rather than bring them out we took more with us than he did and yet were on short rations for two days douglas was the first man in this valley and between his visit and ours except fitzgerald who did not attempt to catch any no man had been into these solitudes the decrease must be entirely due to cats and to a greater extent to weasels from our camp at the foot of ryan's peak we ascended by the track dick had blazed and at nearly four thousand feet reached the open grass the scrub here grew to a higher altitude as the hill faces the sea and on the northwestern spurs i found the scrub at four thousand five hundred feet while on the southeastern side it did not reach much more than three thousand five hundred feet above sea level after travelling some hours we reached a fair place for a bivouac overlooking the architect and copeland valleys close to us was a remarkable rock the spike which is a feature in this view from just below the foot of camp on the karangarua and lies on the southern end of ryan's spur just in the mountain scrub it is a solitary column of rock which has become detached from the rocky spur behind its present position and falling outwards is now poised over the precipice into the copeland valley this rock has a clear reach of fifty-eight feet overhanging the precipice and is fifteen feet thick by sixteen feet in breadth and has the appearance of a great gun mounted to command regina creek valley slightly elevated to drop a shell over the karangarua range 
how far it goes back into the hill or why it retains its position is not clear for it is on the brink of the precipice leaving our bivouac at four a m we travelled along a gently rising grass spur for two hours by the light of a good moon being able to see the mountains on our right like great spectres in the moonlight while on our left the flat country was under a low mist the sun rose clear and bright about an hour before we reached the first or lower peak of the range some five thousand feet above sea level between this and the main peak a narrow rock arete ran for a mile or more too rotten and steep to tackle on the seaward side and having too many awkward gendarmes to allow us to travel along the top the side towards architect creek was smooth and sprinkled with snow giving us some little trouble for we had only one ice axe between us having traversed this slope somewhat difficult in its present condition for an hour we reached a small glacier and found the snow in good order half an hour of steep walking over this brought us to the last rock up which we scrambled without trouble the peak is just under seven thousand feet and easy but with the early winter snow on the steep rocks and with only one ice axe it gave us an interesting climb the last hour over the rocks and snow combined with the most extensive panorama i have ever obtained of the great ranges made dick wish he had been with me the whole summer he was convinced that there could hardly be a finer sport than exploring new country and putting in a climb at intervals i can only say what we saw generally for the effect of such a panorama of snow-clad peaks and glaciers combined with deep valleys flat country and sea is difficult to describe even roughly alpine climbers who read this will sympathize with me and at the same time picture the view to themselves those readers who have not climbed a peak above the snow line could never realize the glory of such a sight even if described by the pen of a ruskin we could see the main range from ellie de beaumont to mount ward a peak in the landsborough valley the hooker range from mount monga to mount hooker the whole of the bismarck range fox neve and balfour range were visible in the north the offshoots of the hooker range faded away in the dim distance to the south and mount little towered up like a miniature matterhorn from the stocky hut across the valley of architect creek to the bottom of which four thousand feet below we could roll the loose stones from the peak to the west the low country with its moraine hills lakes and rivers could be seen from the wataroa river to bruce bay and within six miles the waves of the blue ocean rolling lazily shorewards always four in number for as one disappeared another formed and though they appeared to be ever silently moving towards the beach yet the number never changing gave them the appearance of still motion if such a thing is possible to the north the paparoa range by greymouth was not only visible but shows in the photograph i took from the peak a distance of one hundred and twenty miles the la perouse glacier swept down into cook river almost at our feet on the north in graceful curves and the course of the balfour river was open to no further question the view from here proving that our previous conclusions respecting the balfour and la perouse glacier were correct in every point after an hour or two on the peak basking in the sun and meditating on many things we returned leisurely to our bivouac and descended next morning to camp we left our loads and went on to scott's house here i stayed for a few days with douglas and then returned to the camp to bring our things down a severe gale blocked all the tracks so i was delayed till after easter when i bid farewell to douglas and rode up the coast for hokitika arriving there after four days riding this ride is usually dull and tiresome after so much work but it was varied this time by a ducking in saltwater creek where i took the horse out of his depth douglas having recovered somewhat went south to the waiatoto river where he has a hut and lives a hermit-like existence far from civilization amongst his beloved hills and surrounded by undisturbed nature the return to civilization was pleasant after eight months away of which only three weeks were spent in habitation and for the remainder of which our mode of life is very well expressed in the following extract from an article by professor ludwig buchner on quote, the origin of mankind end quote. Quote, now it is the shelter of a tree now an overhanging rock, now a cave that affords primitive man a suitable sleeping place, for during the day he hardly, if at all, needs a regular dwelling. At times rough shelters are built of bark or branches of trees. In bad weather, end quote. This describes our life during a great part of the season, 
with the exception that we had a piece of canvas always, generally a bat wing, but never a tent. The bat wing is really comfortable enough for all practical purposes, though I am perfectly aware very few would consider it fit shelter even for a week. The hardest part of our life, as no doubt has been gathered from the foregoing pages, was the porterage of our provisions and other necessaries. This was very heavy work over such rough country, when enough stores for several weeks had to be carried by degrees up a river or glacier, together with instruments, field books, and cameras. It is a very different matter for a party, out for a short holiday, to go on small rations, sleep without any shelter, and so on, for they have an easy retreat to their starting point, to which they can take a good camp on a pack-horse. But let me ask any of those who have said, Oh, we don't carry this or that, how they could care for a spell of seven or eight months with only one blanket, a fly, and batwing, and as a rule only a spare shirt and socks by the way of a change of clothes. And this in a part of the country where it rains about three days in a week, and where flooded rivers have to be considered. I am sure a man requires solid food, and cannot rely on essences, extracts, and other such things entirely. And if this is true, then ipso facto his loads must be heavy when going on prolonged expeditions over rough, unknown country. I do not think that anyone, after trying a few months with us, would be inclined to take anything off our list of necessaries. They would soon come to the conclusion that several additions are needful to make life endurable. We had not the means to afford an army of porters, nor did the authorities provide for any additional help. Neither were we justified in rushing as fast as we could through the country, and saying we had explored it. The mountains, valleys, glaciers, and rivers had to be properly examined and mapped, with the branches and tributaries, that is, as well as it could be done with prismatic compasses. This was a matter of time, as has been seen. Hence, a goodly amount of stores was necessary and therefore, again, loads were heavy. It is not intended to convey an impression that we thought the life hard, because we did not. Both Douglas and I loved the work, and accepted its hardships as a matter of course. I have only put forward a few arguments to meet the remarks which have been made in the past, and may be again in the future, to the effect that we carried unnecessary loads and lived unnecessarily roughly. It must be admitted that had we been able to obtain any cola biscuits, or any other food-saving invention, we could have avoided the spells of starvation up Cook River and in the Landsborough and Twain Valleys. When first I took up the work, I sent to England for cola biscuits, and any essence or extracts which might be serviceable. That was in 1893. Again, while in civilization during the winter of 1894, these things were sent for, but the orders were either never delivered or not attended to. They could not be obtained in the colony, so far as I could ascertain. Therefore, though we made a mistake in not having them, it was our misfortune, and not our fault. Photography had to be done under great disadvantages. I carried no tripod. My plates had to be packed for eighty to one hundred miles by the pack-horse mail, and risked getting wet or broken. They were then left in some kindly digger's hut until required. They underwent very rough and tumble usage in the ranges, and after exposure, were often deposited under a stone or some other shelter, until we returned and could pick them up. They were then probably again left in the care of a digger or sent by pack-horse to Hokitika, to be kept till I arrived and could develop them. Some of the valleys were so narrow and the mountains so high that many of the finest scenes, the Sierra for instance, could not be photographed unless by chance we made an ascent on the opposite side of the valley. The exploration of the Twain and Karangarua completed the general exploration and mapping of the central portion of the southern Alps. For all the glaciers and valleys on the eastern side of the divide in this district had been explored by the end of the season, 1889-90, to 90, and the map completed the next year. So far as topographical knowledge is concerned, the information is very advanced. The Westland Survey Department has in its possession the trigonometrical heights and positions of every peak and call of the dividing range from Elie de Beaumont to south of Mount Sefton, with all the chief peaks of the divergent ranges. These were obtained years ago by the geodesical surveyor to the government, from stations on the sea coast and lower hills. In addition to these observations, they have traverses by Douglas and myself of every river and all the principal glaciers in this part of the Alps, innumerable careful sketches, and some three hundred of my photographs from sundry points of vantage 
on both sides of the Alps, from which alone a map could be made approximately correct with the compass, clinometer, and aneroid readings referring to them. Unfortunately, however, the government do not consider it of sufficient importance to bring out a complete and accurate map such as could be made from the above data. They have, in the geodesical surveyor, a careful worker, an enthusiast, and the very man to produce such a map, but for some time past he has been unable to devote his time and energies to a work which no one in New Zealand could do with equal success. Consequently, this wealth of information is lying perdu in the office safe, and we see very indifferent plans issued to travellers. The Royal Geographical Society published the best existing map of this district in January 1893 to illustrate a paper by me on the Southern Alps. Note. The Geographical Journal, Volume 1, page 32. End of note. That was prior to the Western Valleys and glaciers being explored, and our last two seasons' work has greatly altered its appearance. There may be still considerable minor detail work to be done in the district, and a theodolite will have to be taken over the ground, of which Douglas and I have made the reconnaissance surveys, but the whole country is now explored. Of peaks and passes, there are hundreds to be climbed, and these will always add minor details to an almost complete map. The worst of it is that it will be difficult to say exactly what will be valuable as new information in the future until the material in Hokitika is worked into shape. Though some of our best peaks have been climbed, the topographical information derived from the climbs is of little value, for the object of the expeditions seem to be merely the ascent of the peak. The fact is that all the main topographical features have been settled by those who climbed and explored prior to 1891. Note. See Appendix. Note 6. End of note. And beyond the actual topping of peaks, little was left to be done on the eastern slopes of this district, and excepting von Lindefeld's ascent of the Hochstetter Dome, the complete ascents of the higher peaks were not made till after that date, namely Cook, Tasman, Sefton, Hadinger, De La Beche, Darwin, Maltebrunn, the Silberhorn of Tasman, which is hardly a peak by itself, and Seely. The brunt of alpine work was borne by a handful of men climbing before 1892, and this is often forgotten. It is not right to contrast our unsuccessful ascents before that date with subsequent work, because we were learning the game, and those who came after us had the benefit of our experiences, and consequently saved a great deal of time and knew how to go to work. For men to attack such difficult country without guides or experience is very different from following an experienced leader. Though peaks were not scaled then, as they have been since, a great deal of necessarily hard work was done, and later comers do not always realize the benefits they derive from the gathered experience of the pioneers. The work of gathering topographical knowledge has to precede the ascent of peaks. The one may be called useful, the other ornamental. End of chapter 18Chapter 19 of Pioneer Work in the Alps of New Zealand by Arthur Paul Harper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter 19 Glacier Observation. The Number and Area of the Chief Glaciers. Relation of Neve to Trunk. Are the glaciers advancing or retreating? Rates of Motion. The Tasman compared with Franz Joseph. The Future of the Southern Alps. When it is considered that glacier exploration and observation have only been taken up seriously in New Zealand during the last few years, we have every reason to be pleased with the amount of information already collected, more especially as there have only been two or three persons devoting their attention to the subject, the majority having spent their time in climbing peaks only. I assume that a glacier which descends from a neve to a point below the line of perpetual snow is of the, quote, first order, end quote. On this basis there are, within a radius of 17 miles from Mount Cook, or the central portion of the Southern Alps, 31 such glaciers, of which 25 are on the western and 6 on the eastern side of the dividing range. Note. Ice streams of the first order, which are tributaries of larger glaciers, have been included with the main glacier as one, end of note. Of these, Twenty are of a respectable size, sixteen on the west and four on the east, while the remaining eleven are of minor importance, and only hanging glaciers 
sending a tongue of ice down a gully below the snow line though few in number the glaciers on the eastern side of the alps are larger than those on the west with two exceptions because the valleys are fewer but longer it is the number of offshoots and valleys on the west descending to sea level in so short a distance that make that country so hard to explore in speaking of the eastern glaciers within the above radius i must rely on the figures given by mr t n broderick note new zealand alpine journal volume one page three hundred and seven end of note who has alone made any systematic observation on the four larger glaciers in the tasman district and who has most kindly placed his results at my disposal all his work has been done with a theodolite and therefore may be depended on as accurate the following are his figures showing the areas and dimensions of these ice fields name tasman area of glacier in acres thirteen thousand six hundred and sixty four area on which the neve now lies twenty five thousand length eighteen miles zero chains average width one mile fifteen chains greatest width two miles fourteen chains name murchison area of glacier in acres five thousand eight hundred area on which the neve now lies fourteen thousand length ten miles seventy chains average width zero miles sixty six point seven chains greatest width one mile five chains name muller area of glacier in acres three thousand two hundred area on which the neve now lies seven thousand seven hundred and forty length eight miles zero chains average width zero miles fifty chains greatest width zero miles sixty one chains name hooker area of glacier in acres two thousand four hundred and sixteen area on which the neve now lies four thousand one hundred and twelve length seven miles twenty five chains average width zero miles forty one point three chains greatest width zero miles fifty four chains of the many glaciers in westland there are only two larger than the muller and hooker namely the fox and franz joseph there are several others however over four miles in length as our work was only done with a prismatic compass i cannot put the results forward as more than approximate and have not attempted to ascertain the areas of supply and glacier ice this being the case i shall not commit myself by quoting more than a few figures and results the length of the fox glacier is nine and three quarters miles the franz joseph eight and one half miles the balfour six miles the mccarrow five miles the Strontian, la perouse and spencer four and three quarter miles and the victoria glacier four and one quarter miles the douglas glacier has a trunk of three miles seventy chains and a neve running parallel to it of three miles twenty chains in length and therefore the whole glacier would exceed in area some of the above which have a greater length the horace walker also though only three miles sixty chains long receives ice from a large neve for about sixty chains along its side which would make it little less than the spencer in area it would be interesting to make some comparison between the relative proportions between neve and trunk in the case of perfect glaciers and disconnected glaciers one would imagine that given the same general altitude of surrounding ranges the trunk of a disconnected glacier would be smaller in proportion to its neve than in the case of one perfectly formed if we examine the proportions on various glaciers of neve to trunk we find it impossible to advance any rule as to the relation between the two areas the douglas glacier has a neve approximately three times the size of its trunk which is a larger proportion than that of all the other chief glaciers except the franz joseph and fox glaciers which have neves approximately five and three point five times as large as their trunks the supplies of the four glaciers in the tasman district based on the above table are one point eight two point four two point four and one point seven times as large respectively as their trunks the douglas glacier therefore shows an excess of neve such as would be expected but when the area of the balfour glacier is examined we find that its trunk exceeds its neve and is three times as large in area approximately of course in this instance the precipitous nature of the surrounding ranges does not admit of a large snowfield why therefore does the trunk of the balfour attain such a size 
it is larger than that of the douglas also both are shut in by precipices and covered with moraine the douglas has a peak from which to draw supplies one thousand one hundred feet lower than mount tasman and probably has a smaller snowfield to depend on but it has a large flat surface on which a large neve can find a resting place therefore it has better opportunities than the balfour of receiving sufficient supplies to enable a larger trunk to form in the valley however rapidity of descent in the valley bottom and many other facts have to be considered before a satisfactory answer can be given to the various questions which occur to any one seeing these two glaciers everything favors a larger trunk glacier in the douglas than in the balfour it is higher above sea level has a larger neve and the relative positions of the two parts of the glacier are conducive to size but in spite of these facts we find that the douglas with a neve about six times as large as the balfour has a trunk only two-thirds the size i have assumed that the neve is the portion of the glacier well covered with snow at the end of the summer so that the trunk is practically limited to the quote, dry ice end quote. our observations on the glaciers are not of sufficient age yet to determine to what extent they are advancing or retreating in the tasman district reliable traverses which can be replotted at any time were made by mr broderick of the terminal faces of the tasman glacier in november eighteen ninety and the muller glacier in march eighteen eighty nine and november eighteen ninety this is all that has been done to determine advance or retreat and no other observations have been made to compare the present positions of the terminals nor can i ascertain that any cairns to estimate side shrinkage have been erected considering the number of climbers who have during the last three years been in this district it is a pity that a day or two was not spared from the rush after new ascents for the purpose of putting up a few permanent marks personally i have only been in this locality during the few days mentioned with fitzgerald since eighteen ninety two but as far as i could estimate there appeared to be a distinct advance on one side of the terminal face of the tasman glacier owing however to the necessity of immediate return to my work on the west coast i had no time to make closer examination nor erect cairns the hooker river interferes to such an extent with the terminal of the muller glacier that it will never be easy to determine whether alterations are due to retreat or not in the absence of fixed marks and owing to the shortness of time since observations were commenced it can only be said generally that to all appearances no change is taking place in any of the four large glaciers owing to the terminal faces of the fox and franz joseph being so easy to reach and being in a district overrun by diggers we can to some extent estimate the change from hearsay or old photographs and further retreat or otherwise can be measured from the cairns and marks which i have left in these two valleys the franz joseph was about the year eighteen sixty seven according to an old photograph of the terminal face taken by mr pringle far in advance of its present position the ice pushed its way note see the map in chapter eleven end of note against the fourgoche moutonnet and it was possible so i hear from a digger to touch it when on the top of the sentinel rock the park and harbour rocks were covered and apparently the muller and strauchon were half enveloped by the ice i estimate that the glacier at that date was eighty or one hundred yards further in advance and ten yards wider on the east bank on the average than in september eighteen ninety four there is evidence of this retreat on the rocky banks of the glacier on the east side both at the terminal face and further up the valley the rocks for some yards ahead of the ice and for some feet above its present position exhibit clean newly rubbed surfaces of a lighter colour than the rocks above this at first misled me to expect a large winter advance but it evidently testifies to a recent retreat all along the line the positions of the cairns which i have made for future reference can be seen in appendix note seven the fox glacier as already stated is moraine covered at the terminal face for a few chains back and therefore the changes would not be so rapid it is narrow and uninteresting at this point during our visit in eighteen ninety four our scientific ardour was damped by excessive rain and when i was alone on the glacier my unlucky mishaps prevented extra work we have therefore only two marks note see appendix note seven end of note at the terminal face for future reference the moraine-covered ice here enabled many diggers to cross the river on the glacier 
and we may gather to some extent the position of the snout in 1894, as compared with that of 25 years earlier. From these accounts I estimate that no change has taken place, a conclusion borne out by the fact that there are here no such marks of recently dressed surfaces of rock like that noticed on the Franz Joseph. At the terminal face there is a low dead moraine with some scrub growing on it, and the ice practically touches that now, as it did twenty-five years ago. The surface moraine is evidently of great age, for there are several pieces of vegetation on it, some little distance from the actual snout. From hearsay evidence again, it is clear that some twenty years ago the Spencer Glacier in the Callery Valley descended into the river, the water washing against a face of ice, so the diggers say. In 1893, though not close enough to measure its exact distance from the river, I could see that it was at least a chain away. Thus, retreating seems to be going on here, while from all accounts the Burton has not altered its position. In summing up the results of my personal observation on these glaciers, it seems that while the Hooker, Muller, Burton, and Fox glaciers have undergone no change during the periods in which they have been known to us, the Spencer and Franz Joseph are retreating, and the Tasman to a slight degree advancing. On the other chief glaciers, the McCarrow, Marchant, Horace Walker, Balfour, Strauchon, Fetz, Douglas, Victoria, and Murchison, I could see no marked signs of recent change of position. The conclusion, therefore, if we may presume to draw one after such short knowledge, seems to be that at present the New Zealand glaciers are not receding to any appreciable extent. On the subject of glacier motion, we have some interesting figures, those of Mr. Broderick on the four glaciers of the Tasman district, and those of Douglas and myself on the Franz Joseph. As Mr. Broderick has been kind enough to place his at my disposal, I shall quote them in toto. Tasman Glacier, line one near the Ball Glacier, rods set on the 5th of December, 1890, and reset on the 7th January, 1891. Station one, total movement, 27.2 feet. Average daily rate, 9.9 .9 inches. Station two, total movement, 41 feet. Average daily rate, 14.9 inches. Station three, total movement, 47.7 feet. Average daily rate, 17.3 inches. Station 4. Total movement, 48.4 feet. Average daily rate, 17.6 inches. Station 5. Total movement, 49.6 feet. Average daily rate, 18 inches. Station 6. Total movement, 46.9 feet. Average daily rate, 17 inches. Station 7. Total movement, 44.2 feet. Average daily rate, 16.1 inches. Station 8. Total movement, 38.3 feet. Average daily rate, 13.9 inches. Line 2. Ranged from point of the Malterbrunn Spur. First set December 5, 1890 and reset. 7th January, 1891. Station 2. Total movement, 6.5 feet. Daily rate, 2.4 inches. Station 3. Total movement, 25.9 feet. Daily rate, 9.4 inches. Station 4. Total movement, 28.7 feet. Daily rate, 10.4 inches. Station 5. Total movement, 32.7 feet. Daily rate, 11.8 inches. Station 6. Total movement, 36.6 feet. Daily rate, 13.3 inches. Station 7. Total movement, 33.7 feet. Daily rate, 12.2 inches. Station 8. Total movement, 34.4 feet. Daily rate, 12.5 inches. Station 9. Total movement, 29 feet. Daily rate, 10.5 inches. Station 10. Total movement, 25.4 feet. Daily rate, 9.2 inches. Station 11. Total movement, 13.9 feet. Daily rate, 5 inches. Murchison. Line ranged from point above Dixon Glacier. Set on December 29, 1890. Reset 48 hours later. Station 78. Total movement, 1 inch. Daily rate, 0.5 inches. Station 79. Total movement, 7 inches. Daily rate, 3.5 inches. Station 80. 
total movement one foot four inches daily rate eight inches station eighty one total movement one foot five and one half inches daily rate eight point seven inches station eighty two total movement one foot two inches daily rate seven inches station eighty three total movement nine inches daily rate four point five inches station ninety two total movement nine point two inches daily rate four point six inches station ninety three total movement five point two inches daily rate two point six inches hooker line ranged at a point three quarter mile from the terminal face set at noon on april fourth eighteen eighty nine and reset april seventh eighteen eighty nine at eight a m station one total movement three point three inches daily rate one point one inches station two total movement eight point two inches daily rate two point nine inches station three total movement twelve inches daily rate four point two inches station four fifteen point four inches daily rate five point four inches station five total movement twelve point eight inches daily rate four point five inches muller various marked stones first observed on the twenty ninth march eighteen eighty nine and again on the fourteenth november eighteen ninety and third december eighteen ninety three station one eighteen eighty nine to eighteen ninety total movement two hundred and thirty nine point three feet daily rate four point eight inches eighteen ninety to eighteen ninety three total movement three hundred and ninety two point seven feet daily rate four point two inches station two eighteen eighty nine to eighteen ninety total movement two hundred and seventy one point seven daily rate five point five inches eighteen ninety to eighteen ninety three total movement three hundred and seventy one point four feet daily rate four point one inches station three eighteen ninety to eighteen ninety three total movement four hundred and six point three feet daily rate four point four inches station four total movement two hundred and sixty two point six feet daily rate five point three inches eighteen ninety to eighteen ninety three total movement four hundred and twenty four point eight feet daily rate four point five inches station five eighteen eighty nine to eighteen ninety total movement three hundred and fifty nine point six feet daily rate seven point three inches eighteen ninety to eighteen ninety three total movement four hundred and thirty six point four feet daily rate four point seven inches station six eighteen eighty nine to eighteen ninety total movement three hundred and ninety eight feet daily rate eight inches station seven eighteen eighty nine to eighteen ninety total movement six hundred and eleven feet daily rate twelve point three inches station eight eighteen eighty nine to eighteen ninety total movement five hundred and six feet daily rate ten point two inches eighteen ninety to eighteen ninety three total movement eight hundred and eighty nine point two feet daily rate nine point six inches station nine eighteen eighty nine to eighteen ninety total movement four hundred and nine inches daily rate eight point two inches total movement four hundred and nine feet daily rate eight point two inches eighteen ninety to eighteen ninety three total movement five hundred and fifty seven point five feet daily rate six point two inches station ten eighteen eighty nine to eighteen ninety total movement three hundred and eighty eight point one feet daily rate seven point one inches station eleven eighteen eighty nine to eighteen ninety total movement one hundred and forty six point one feet daily rate two point nine inches on the tasman murchison and hooker rods were carefully set and reset in lines across the glaciers the instrument used was a five-inch theodolite Quote, a different method was adopted on the muller in order to show the direction as well as the velocity four trigonometrical stations were placed on the huge lateral moraines near the lower end of a glacier and they were then used as bases for determining trigonometrically the positions of the stones on the ice each stone had a number painted on it and every care taken in observing the great steadiness of the ice motion is a noticeable feature the stones have retained the same upright positions 
for nearly five years, and the rods supported on them by piles of stones in 1889 were found there in 1893. The original positions of the stones on the Muller Glacier must be stated in order to draw any conclusions from their rate of motion. Number one is in the centre of the glacier, 63 chains from the terminal. Number two is in the centre of the glacier, 53 chains from the terminal. Number three is in the centre of the glacier, 61 chains from the terminal. Number four is in the centre of the glacier, 77 chains from the terminal. Number five is in the centre of the glacier, 89 chains from the terminal. Number six is in the centre of the glacier, 107 chains from the terminal. Number seven is in the centre of the glacier, 122 chains from the terminal. Number eight is in the centre of the glacier, 145 chains from the terminal. Number nine is 10 chains from the south side and 122 chains from the terminal. Number 10 is two chains from the south side and 111 chains from the terminal. Number 11 is 11 chains from the south side and 48 chains from the terminal. From these figures, we see that the rate of motion is not constant, for the stones had not travelled so far towards the terminal face as to account for the decreased motion in 1893. It is also evident that the winter flow must be very sluggish, for the Muller Glacier has a greater fall per mile than the Tasman, and therefore at least as great a rate of motion would be expected. It is evident that the lower average rate is due to the observations extending over winter as well as summer. All the other measurements record summer motion only. The only glacier measured on the west coast is the Franz Joseph, the motion of which Douglas and I endeavoured to estimate in 1893. I put forward our results with some misgivings, for they are very startling. We placed a row of stakes along the ice, and reset the line again after the intervals mentioned in the table below but though every care was used, the results can only be quoted as approximate, for a prismatic compass is not sufficiently accurate, and may be responsible for a considerable error in such observations. The figures, however, are just as likely to be under as over the mark, for it is impossible to say on which side the error would be, when it is considered that we could see with a naked eye the change in position of a mark on the ice after an interval of twenty-four hours, it is evident that the daily summer motion is very considerable. The side motion in the following table is accurate, for we had marks on ice and rock to check our results. Franz Joseph. Line 1, Station 1. 7 days. Total movement, 35 inches. Daily rate, 5 inches. Direction, magnetic, 320. Remarks, 15 yards from north side. Line 1, Station 2. 20 days. Total movement, 600 inches. Daily rate, 30 inches. Direction, magnetic, 335.3. Remarks, about five chains north side. Line 1, station 3. Four days, 531 inches total movement. Daily rate, 132.75. Direction, magnetic, 300. Line 1, station 4. Four days. Total movement, 408 inches. Daily rate, 102 inches. Direction magnetic, 352. Line 1, station 5, 4 days. Total movement, 212 inches. Daily rate, 53 inches. Direction magnetic, 314. Line 1, station 6, no return. Line 2, station 1, 3 days. Total movement, 460 inches. Daily rate, 153.3 inches. Direction, magnetic, 286. Remarks, eight chains from north side. Line two, station two. Three days. Total movement, 474 inches. Daily rate, 158 inches. Direction, magnetic, 308. Line two, station three. Three days. Total movement, 600 inches. Daily rate, 209 inches. Direction, magnetic, 285.3. Line 2, station 4. Number of days, 3. Total movement, 621. Daily rate, 207. Direction, magnetic, 260.3. Line 2, station 5. 
three days crevasse opened peg lost line two station six three days total movement seventy one inches daily rate twenty three point six inches direction magnetic two hundred and forty two point three remarks six chains from the south side station side motion by arch creek seven days total movement fifty seven inches daily rate seven point two eight inches direction magnetic three hundred and thirty five remarks eight feet from north side line one was just above a small ice fall ninety chains from the terminal face and was set on the twenty second november eighteen ninety three line two was above another steep fall in the glacier and at the foot of the great ice fall one hundred and ninety chains from the terminal face peg number six shows that the motion is considerably checked by cape defiance and that the ice is taking a direction towards harper's creek the very rotten nature of the ice at the margin of the glacier prevented a nearer approach to either bank here this line was set on november twenty third eighteen ninety three the last station by arch creek was set on november thirteenth eighteen ninety three and checked by marks on the rocks it was forty-three chains from the terminal face the above tables fully bear out the fact that a glacier moves faster in the centre than at the sides and also that the rate of motion decreases as the terminal face is approached the actual influence of the tributary streams of ice on the motion of the main glacier cannot be decided from our observations it would be interesting to set on foot a system of measurements from which to arrive at some comparison between the rate of flow of tributaries and that of the main glacier and if possible follow the movement of the ice of the various streams after they have joined forces for i presume that though to all appearances these streams unite yet they do not mingle nor do they lose their individuality altogether if this is true it would add to our general knowledge on the subject to try and follow the individual streams after they meet to draw satisfactory conclusions with regard to the rapidity with which a glacier flows at different angles of descent would be impossible from the above tables before any law can be laid down on the subject much more complete measurements are necessary the lines of pegs would have to be arranged at relative distances from the respective terminals in the tables quoted the rates of motion have been taken promiscuously and only in two instances do the lines lie at all in similar positions as regards the terminal face reducing each glacier to one hundred chains in length we find by reducing the other figures that the lines of measurement were placed as follows tasman line one thirty six point one chains from terminal tasman line two twenty six point three chains from terminal hooker ten point two chains from terminal franz joseph line one thirteen chains from terminal franz joseph line two twenty seven point five chains from terminal this gives us two cases in which the rates of motion can be in any degree compared namely line two on the tasman and line two on the franz joseph assuming that the figures returned for the latter glacier are correct we find that its maximum rate is rather more than fourteen times as great as that of the former this is a very startling difference until we examine the respective falls per mile of these two ice streams which are as follows tasman total fall three hundred and thirteen point three feet per mile from neve to terminal one hundred and eighty seven point seven feet per mile franz joseph total fall nine hundred and forty one point one feet per mile from neve to terminal one thousand and sixty four feet per mile the latter glacier therefore has three times as great a total fall and nearly six times as great a fall per mile below the neve as the former a series of careful observations which would give us the motion of the tributary streams and their influence in retarding or helping the flow of the whole mass together with systematic measurements in similar relative positions combined with the average fall per mile should give us considerable help in deciding the laws relating to glacier motion the effect of obstructions in the valleys and various other results which we cannot compute from our present observations i have in the case of the tasman and franz joseph merely set down the particulars for they are the only two that can be compared from observations already taken some one may perhaps be able to draw satisfactory conclusions from the figures which i fear i am unable to do all these points of scientific interest can be determined in europe 
with as great exactness as in the New Zealand Alps. But the great attraction of the latter is that besides being able to make satisfactory observations, the observer has the pleasure of several virgin peaks to ascend, and also can observe the effects of a low snow and ice line in a warm climate. There is far greater activity in the southern Alps than in the European, and therefore the effects of snow and ice are more marked, and much more easily recorded. The avalanches are more frequent, falling night and day, than in Europe. The glaciers descend to a lower level, and the country is more shattered. Consequently, the action of snow and ice in altering the conformation of the country is going on to a greater and more noticeable extent. I do not know the Caucasus, but am well acquainted with Switzerland, and know Norway more or less. My comparison, therefore, only applies to the two latter countries. To a traveller seeking fine scenery, the southern Alps, especially the western side, offers a splendid field. I used to say that, below the snow line, New Zealand could not be compared with Switzerland. That was before I had been into the then unknown western ranges. I now say without hesitation that the southern Alps can not only be compared to, but in many cases exceed in grandeur, the scenery of Switzerland. The only thing lacking is the presence of human interest, for there are no picturesque peasants and chalets to give an added charm to the wild and glorious scenes met with at every turn. I often picture to myself a flood of tourists, overrunning New Zealand, as they overrun Switzerland and Norway, and imagine future developments resulting from such an influx. We should see, perhaps, a fine hotel or two on Welcome Flat, others on Castles Flat or at the head of the Twain, all of which localities far surpass many popular resorts in Europe in their attractions. However, may the day be far distant when hotels shall spring up like mushrooms in the glorious valleys of Westland, and the crack of the whip and clatter of wheels of Cobb and Co.'s royal mail coaches disturb their solitudes, and awake protesting echoes from their awe-inspiring cliffs and precipices. I do not wish these glories of nature to be hidden from travellers. Far from it, but should like to see a far-seeing government constructing a few horse tracks and huts in some localities, which Douglas or I can mention. A few hundred pounds a year less spent on experimental legislation would enable such tracks to be gradually made, and the localities thus rendered accessible would attract travellers who would benefit the colony far more than Acts of Parliament. Travellers, however, must not expect to view magnificent scenery without some trouble and a little discomfort in a young colony. But for all that, they should not be debarred from seeing the finest sights for want of a few tracks. If the foregoing pages induce any persons to make an attempt to visit the Southern Alps for pleasure, or in pursuit of science or adventure, and if they cause the authorities to value properly one of the finest assets in the wealth of the country, I shall feel that my work has produced some tangible result. End of chapter 19